talk about the things that, that are most commonly found. I do a lot of ADA work. I mentioned that briefly in the last presentation. I've been doing it since 92. Um, and what we can do on our drawings to try and mitigate some of the things that go wrong, that go bump in the dark. So I'll flash through these because you've already read them. And what we're going to do is try and understand those nuances of compliance. Um, this is a, an advanced course, so we're going to focus on the Florida Accessibility Code for Building Construction. Understanding that the ADA and the Florida Accessibility Code are very, 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 very similar. And where there are differences that are pertinent to our conversation, I'll highlight them. Uh, we're going to look at the common reasons for not compliance, some of which you might know. We're going to look at a few things that you might have missed. Um, and then understand how construction affects accessibility issues, because a lot of it happens then. Um, so just quickly, review of dates. ADA was published, the 2010 uh, guidelines were published on September 15th, became effective March 15th of 2011, uh, and then the compliance date was March 15th of 2012. In the interim, you could pick and choose which of the two standards you could design to but you could not jump from one to the other. You had to pick all of one or all of the other. Similarly, the Florida Building Code, the dates are a little bit different only because its approval cycle was somewhat different. The effective date was March 15, 2012, but that holiday period where you had a pick actually ran from July 1, 2011 through March 15 of 2012 because that was when those effective dates took place. So those are all past. The reason I put them up is so that you understand a couple of key elements that are in here. Element by element safe harbor. The ADA in 2010 published a safe harbor that said basically elements in covered facilities that were built or altered in compliance with 1991 standards are not required to be brought into compliance with the 2010 standards unless and until those elements are subject to a planned alteration. Now, in my line of work, I do a lot of this because a lot of times every attorney files suit under the 2010 standards. And the first thing I do is I go look at when the building was built. And more often than not, it was the 94 standards. Now, lately in Miami, they're hitting a lot of restaurants. Well, there was a significant change in restaurants with respect to the amount of seating. And I always go, no, 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 you don't get 2010, you get 1994. The relevance of this to you is that when you're working on a project that is 1994, or 91 standards, the guidelines were 94. You don't have to bring them up to 2010 unless you're working on that particular part of the building. Anything you touch has to come up to 2010. But if you do find something that is not in compliance with the 91 standards, then you are required to bring them up to not the 91, but the 2010. Okay, now the easiest way to do it is at the point that we're at now in history, just design everything to 2010. But when you're working in a renovation environment where there are elements that may already be in compliant, don't tell your clients that they have to go out and change a whole bunch of stuff unless you're going to you know, deal with that in the work anyway. And the 28 CFR is where this language actually is. You won't find that in the, in the guidelines. The language is in the um, um, congressional register at that citation. What the Florida Building Code did was in 101.2, it basic it punted. It basically said the document doesn't address existing facilities unless altered. It doesn't say that you're safe harbored, but by saying it doesn't address it unless safe altered, and then the rest of it says we rely on the Department of Justice and Title III of the ADA, that throws you back to the element by element safe harbor. But in 202.4, there's an exception that says that if you are a private entity and you've constructed or altered required elements of a path of travel at a place of public accommodation or commercial facility in accordance with blah, 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 the private entity is not required to retrofit such elements to reflect incremental changes in the proposed standards solely because of an alteration to a primary function area served by that path of travel. If I'm renovating this room if everything between the entrance to the site and the door to this room is complying with the 91, I do not have a duty to update anything along that path. Okay? That's what this essentially says. 
So a lot of times we've had difficulties with some building departments. Particular difficulty is in what they define as a primary use area. You know, bathroom is not necessarily a primary use area unless you're at a campground and it's the bathhouse. But that's the usual difficulty when somebody calls me about this that I encounter. But keep that in mind. When you're working in a specific area of the building, you don't have to retroactively update everything that gets you to that area as long as that's already compliant with the 91 standards. If there is one element between here and there that was not in compliance, <laughs> yeah, I love those questions. Then you do have to update that one. The question is, for me, whether or not that would trigger the entire path, okay? And I'm going to say, I'm going to jump off of that plank and say no. I'm going to fix that element. I'm going to bring it up to 2010 standards. I'm not going to fix everything else that was along that route, simply because one element. Remember that ADA speaks about elements, you know? So I use that very literally uh, when I'm doing reviews. <coughs> so this is the same thing we just talked about. It's just that elements that are not um, or that are compliant do not have to be brought up to 2010. The exception is those supplemental requirements that are found only in the 2010. And that's usually at the back end, and, you know, uh, 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 swimming pools, uh, recreational facilities, all of the marinas, all of those things that were added. It's, I think it's chapter 10 and beyond if I'm not mistaken. So the demons, why things tend to go wrong? First of all, a compliance requires attention to detail, particularly during construction. You're talking about fractions of an inch, whether you're in compliance with something or not. Construction is it, it's not in their DNA to have that level of accuracy. So that's one of the problems. It requires conscious applications of design principles when you're laying this out. You can't just go with what looks good. You've got to check sometimes two or three different things to make sure you're not triggering something wrong. And you have to try and design intolerances whenever possible. You know, if a ramp is 1 in 12 maximum and you can afford the space to go 1 in 16, you know, a lot of people say, well, 1 in 16, I said, you know, I like to go with like 1 in 13. You know, why do you do that? I go, because it's an unusual number. Have you ever draw, driven through a parking lot of, say, a condominium, and the speed limit sign is maximum speed limit 12 miles an hour? Okay, it draws your attention, doesn't it? So I like to mess with people and draw their attention, because the chances of getting one in 13 are nil. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the truth. But the fact is, design in some tolerances. And understand that materials, you know, concrete grows as it sets. You know, and yeah, and a lot of, you know, parking lots. I love asphalt paved parking lots because they pave them with those big honking asphalt thingies. That's a very technical term, by the way. I use that frequently in court. And what happens when they get to the end of the run, they pick it up. Have you ever wondered why at the head of parking spaces, there's usually a twirl up in the asphalt? And technically, if it's within that dimensional size that's required of that parking space, it's a non-compliance. So, you know, and trees push up through asphalt a lot easier than they do through concrete, although concrete has never stopped a good tree from pushing up. But I tell this to clients. You know, one of my biggest projects in ADA, and Larry worked with me on it, in fact, one of, at least one of the pictures is on here, was City of Miami Parks. And I recommend it to them, do something, because City of Miami Parks, parks have trees, trees push up. Every single parking lot had issues. I said, well, consider trimming back the trees to the extent that you can and go to a harder surface. They did it for about a year. Um, it's amazing how easily things can go wrong. <laughs> Based on my years of experience, I'm going to tell you that most violations don't occur as a matter of design. Now, that is not to say I haven't seen some doozies, <laughs> and I will show you some today. But the majority actually occur as a result of either poor or unattended construction, doing things the way we've always done them, my favorite phrase to hate. Or many, many more happen as a result of operations, maintenance, housekeeping, repair. I mean, how many of us have seen those paper dispensers from hell? You've seen them. They're black plastic. They're the size of my pickup truck. They're a protrusion, folks. Plain and simple. But owners love them because the paper company comes in and gives it to them. 
because they want you to use their paper, and only their paper fits the equipment. But I don't see a reason why I have to have a, paper to a toilet paper dispenser in a stall that provides 12 years of toilet paper. But the paper guys sell it. Oh, your maintenance people won't ever have to come back in here. How old's your guy, 64? No, he'll never be back before retirement. So you get this thing, you know? So that happens. The point is compliance requires constant attention. That's actually a line from a presentation I did for clients, institutional clients, because they forget, okay? But to the extent that you can provide this to your clients, it would help them. You don't believe me? Look at these two wonders. Now, the left one is pretty obvious. You can see the curb ramp was built much more recently than the, than the uh, walkway it's cut into. But you got to wonder, whoever thought we need to do an accessibility improvement here by providing a curb ramp, did they not see the speed bump? Was it not in their scope? Or did they just want to provide fodder for me or someone like me to take a picture? Now, this one happens to be one of Larry's pictures. I love it. The right one is Curtis Park in the city of Miami. Look at this wonder. Speed bump. You know, you got to protect that. You, you don't want any speeding wheelchairs in accessible spaces. So you still think stupid mistakes don't happen? Let me show you. I actually don't have that many because Larry's the one that has the most incredible collection of pictures, but he holds on tight to them. All right, how many of you have these in your practice? You insert this as a, as a standard sheet. Let me tell you why I hate them. I despise them. Did I tell you I don't like them? They're pretty useless. Why? With the exception of the towel bar height, which this one actually doesn't, oh, it's over here which would never appear in any of my drawings because I don't design the installation of towel bars. None of that information is project specific. And by providing this, you're expecting the contractor, let's not even go that far, you're expecting someone who works for the contractor to put this one with that one with that one with this one with that one into that room and make the room comply. Guess what is not going to happen? Compliance. The other problem with this is they're often out of date and even more often just wrong. So this is from a set of drawings that I was asked to peer review. That's why the title block is off. Here's what happened to that drawing when I was done with it. Wrong references, out of date references, references to the wrong or inapplicable codes, all over the place. So, I don't know that I'm actually discouraging you from using this type of sheet, but if you do, make sure it's accurate, and it cannot substitute for the project-specific information that you're going to put elsewhere on the drawings. Because despite all of this information on doors that was on this thing, and it was actually on the other, this is bathrooms, the doors was on a second sheet, a follow-up sheet. Um, Despite all that information on maneuvering clearances for the door, I found at least five spots on the drawings where they blew the maneuvering clearance. Now, that was a design error of the worst kind because you had the information on here and you ignored it. So I don't like these things. And I caution you if you're going to use them to make sure, like with anything else you do on your drawings, make sure the information's accurate. Don't rely on them, okay? Now we're going to talk, I didn't say this overtly at the beginning, but this isn't a walk through the code, this is picking on specific items. So we're going to jump from item to item, okay? Detectable warnings. Why are you still using them? They're no longer required. The 2010 standard took that out. There's only on your property, okay? If it's required by FDOT, meaning it's on public right-of-way, still required. The only time it's required on your property are transportation spots, uh, stops and um, um, train pl uh, platforms. Not many of my projects have either of those two. Why do you still use them? So you ask, well, why not? Well, look, the problem with these is, and I've done a little bit of expert witness work as a consultant to a forensic company where we were doing, I was doing some slip and falls and some trip and falls. Didn't do too much of it. I can tell you that these things wear and become slippery. 
particularly the plastic ones like this one. They're more commonly in yellow. Um, this is actual from one of the projects that we reviewed. The other thing that it does do is it delaminates, it comes apart, it pops up, it's not installed tight to the ground. There was another, uh, see this picture here, how that bows out like that? That's a trip hazard. So you're doing more damage or harm, potential harm, than you are good. And the other thing is, maybe it's just me, somebody told me you've got plantar fasciitis. I said, I don't know what that is and I don't pay attention to that commercial. But when I walk over these things, they hurt. Do you have a question? No, I was just gonna say the other thing is people don't get the, the, the uh, other, you know, the opposite color thing going on. Yeah. There's so many places these are screwed up. <coughs> and other than FDOT, right? You know, but we fought this for years and they wanted to stick them everywhere and they still do. Civil engineers still stick them everywhere. And we're gonna to get to that when I get to that sheet. I'm gonna ask, why are you listening to your civil engineers for accessibility? I'm not, I'm not going to say anything else. They design everything in a one to 20, so it's about, you know, that big. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I have always been cautious with them because I noticed that they were slippery before somebody said, no, they are slippery. The firm I was working with, uh, there was actually a, one of the experts out of the main office in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, had a big case in, I think, Philadelphia, where it was a slip and fall that was just, the thing was worn to the point where the surface was slick, it was raining, <laughs> person fell and almost got run over by a car, very, very close to getting run over by a car. So they're difficult for people that have any kind of foot impediments, you know, uh, the feel kind, which by the way is very common in, as you get older, okay? They're difficult to navigate. The other thing that I hate, and it's off topic, so I'm gonna be very short about it, is that the, one of the allowances with curb ramps is in, in um, uh, streets, is that if you've got a diagonal curb ramp, it can, it can qualify that whole side of the intersection so you don't have to do one this way and one that way. But the, the thing is that the diagonal one has to be within the crosswalks, right? You know this. Have you noticed, think about this when you're out in the street, over the years, crosswalks have started to move out into the intersection box. The reason? To get the diagonal curb ramps into the crosswalk. They just redid a major intersection near my office back home. And I'm telling you, those crosswalks are so far out into the box. Both are high speed streets. They're not supposed to be, but they are. That I'm uncomfortable walking in that crosswalk because of how far out into traffic I am. That's one of the unforeseen circumstances of that little exemption of doing the diagonals. And the cities are all over it. My city's all over it. I don't think I've seen a directional one in years. So, don't, don't use them unless somebody specifically asks you to do them and then try and talk them out of it. The other problem with detectable warnings was location, location, location. What does it really tell the person? Now, the one on the left is a project of my own. The civil engineer drew it this way. Why do you listen to your civil engineers? I caught it and I told my owner, and this was, unfortunately, this is an older project. This is the only picture I have. So I'm gonna describe the circumstances if it isn't already clear to you. That is the entrance to a hotel near Fort Lauderdale International Airport. It is a two-sided driveway with a landscape median in between. The street sidewalk goes through it right where this is, and you can see it continuing on towards the other side. I had not shown detectable warnings at the median. Civil engineers showed them, told the contractor, you must install them. Look at those detectable warnings. There's no space between them. The guy's giving me a hard time because I don't know what I'm doing. I said, put yourself in the place of someone who cannot see. You're coming along the sidewalk, tap, 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 detectable warning, I'm entering a street. Okay, caution. I don't hear anything, I proceed. I get to the median, tap, 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 ah, I'm safe. I continue to walk. The guy didn't get you going out, but the other guy got you coming in. Why? Because you gave the wrong clue to that person. And there were examples, not this vivid, but there were examples of this all along, and I wouldn't doubt if you could walk nearby and find several. The ones like this one. This is recent, this public housing project. This inspection's about six months old. So this walkway is that walkway coming from the building headed towards the other building on the site. The accessible spaces, as you can see, the blue stripe are along here. They place these right there because 
some brain, thought, I have got people coming across here and entering the sidewalk, or more importantly, I've got people from the sidewalk wanting to come this way. I'm not going to argue. And they're also going that way, so we're going to combine them, we're going to do them <coughs> as one. Problem is, look at how much walking there is when you're walking that way from the moment you got that clue to the moment you actually entered the safety zone. It wasn't my job to tell them. I did call it out as a non-compliance. They couldn't understand. Civil engineer has it on their drawings. The architect doesn't even touch the site. I guarantee you, you're going to get sued too. So keep that in mind. They're hazardous when they don't give the right information. So if you're going to use them, at least make sure they're being used right. I had to fight my client, a good client. I said, I can't believe you're this dense. Do you not understand what's going on here? Well, we got to get the CO. Let's not do it now. We'll do it afterwards. I don't know whether it ever got taken off. I wrote a very stern letter, <laughs> and that was it. Sir? How was it resolved? How would it convert it to two opposing apartment spaces? These? Yeah, into contact. Well, it's private property, so I would have resolved it by not putting them in because they're not required. But if they were required, I've never considered that entering a parking space, a, a parking space is not a vehicular drive. The standards say vehicular drive. The vehicular drive is here. The arrow is a telltale. Please. So I wouldn't have put them here, I would have put them there. But I have also had architects tell me, yeah, but the reviewer said I got to have them there too. And I go, why? Well, because if I exit that way, eventually I get to a vehicular drive. <laughs> then it should have been at the other end too. I can't argue with stupid, you know? Let's just put detectable warnings everywhere. The whole parking lot will be a detectable warning. Nobody will be able to walk, never mind safely navigate the driveway. Just get rid of them, they're no longer required. And I, I just say that because I still see them. I do a lot of peer review for the public housing agency for other architects that are doing their work. They don't have to comply with ADA, they're complying with UFAS, uh, Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards. Same shit, different name. And it never required it. And they're still putting them in, why? Their civil engineer has it on their drawings. It's their typical curb cut sheet. F dot curb number this, F, F dot curb number that. That's fine on the public sidewalk. <coughs> Don't put them on my property. Challenge your engineers, people. Challenge <coughs> your engineers. They think they're ADA experts because they know one piece of it, and clearly they don't know it completely. Cross slopes. Beware of cross slopes. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite, this is how we always used to do it, line. I have an architect in my building. He's got this, he's, his office is downstairs from me. Uh, he's married to a gal that might as well be my cousin. They're, we're not blood relatives, but I've known them since they were babies. And I've known Tony since he went through school. He's got his firm, yada, yada. He likes to debate me. As you might imagine, I enjoy a bit of debate myself. So we're in the coffee shop and he's talking about, you know, I don't know why we need ADA experts because I, I'm an ADA expert, I know what I'm doing. I go, well, um, I'm pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how are you doing? So he says, well, this new facility that he's quite proud of, and rightfully so, it's a beautiful facility, won some awards that we just finished. I can tell you it's completely, completely uh, compliant. I said, okay. He says, I'll tell you what. Without going out there, I can tell you one place where you're likely to have a violation. Oh, impossible. It's never going to happen. I said, okay, Tony, answer this question. Are there multiple paths from the parking area to the door? Yeah. Do those paths at any point cross? Yeah. I said, you've got a violation on one of those. Oh, no. And I said, as a matter of fact, if you tell me which one they poured first, I'll tell you where the violation is. Because how does the violation occur? do de do do I'm framing that one. I've got all those edge forms set up. They're perfect. They've got that 5% running slope. They're at four because they listened to one of my seminars and they decided not to push the envelope. So they're at four. Perfect. They're going to form the cross path. Bad example, because this isn't concrete. I get it, but it's the pictures I had. They're going to form the crosswalk. Where do they hang the forms? Anyone? On the forms that are already there. 
So there's a form here. This form gets hung on that. This form gets hung on that. Presto changeo, you now have a 4% cross slope on the end of that crosswalk. I explained that to Tony, and that was the end of the conversation. He ran out of time. Oh, got a meeting to go to. Be careful. So how do we protect? Clearly, this is a construction issue, right? You're not responsible for that. Correct. What I'm telling you and what I will show you next, I think, yes. Take proactive steps with your drawings to try and mitigate it. You're not going to go out there and hold the contractor's hand all the time. But do what you can. Now, I apologize for the size because it's the only way I could fit it in. But this is one of our hotels. And you can see that we've got what I call a box out. There's one there, there's one there. That one's there for a different reason, I'll tell you in a minute. There's uh, one here. There's a big, long one here. And then if you followed the building around, you'd see more of them. The note says, within indicated area, no slope in any direction shall be greater than 2%. Will they read it? God knows. Did I put it there? Yep. Mr. Architect, shouldn't you have done something better? I said, well, counselor, short of putting a neon light on this, or pardon me, I'm not sustainable, an LED light on it, <laughs> I've done all I can do. Why is it at the door? Anybody? Come on, I'm testing to see if you're awake. Why is it at the door? <laughs> Maneuvering clearance at the door has to be flat and level. Very often missed because we're anxious to get the water away from the door. Understandable. Water flows at 2%. Not as fast as it does at 45%, but hey, we got to work within what we got to work. So graphically pick up whatever you can. Yes, sir. Is one eighth of a foot considered still a slope uh, surface? I'd have to do higher order math. Uh, actually, it's, uh, it's 1 in 48. It's 1 48. So it's 1%. It's 1%. Yeah, one, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you'd be surprised how often. The problem is nobody's, nobody's checking this in the field. Very few contractors are really checking this in the field. But you're dealing with construction material. It's hard to get. No, I under, fully understand. This isn't about how you prevent them. This is about doing the most you can to avoid them. Shit happens. <laughs> OK? The excrement will hit the fan even if you turn it off. It'll just stick. Okay, so these are clues. Here's some other ways we do it. There's that box. Again, uh, this is at sideway ramps that come down to a low area for the accessible route to the parking. You don't see the rest of it because I wouldn't have been able to fit it in. Here's another one where I actually combined. I calculate actual elevations. I didn't have a civil engineer on here. So I'm not asking you to calculate the elevations when you've got a civil engineer, but I would check them. Because I have checked on that other hotel that I had up a few minutes ago, when I checked the civil engineer's calculations, they had a cross slope in the sidewalk that was more than 2%. And I caught it. So check them. Here we didn't have a civil engineer. This is a barrier removal project where we didn't need one. And so it's hard to tell, but I've got the, you know, I've got the cross boxes. I've got the elevations. I've got everything I could possibly put on this one because this was going to be absolute low bid. And I knew that we were not likely to get a very highly experienced, competent contractor on this. So I gave him everything. I've got slope indications. I've got step indications. I've got elevations. When you do that, because when I used to teach construction documents, I would say the surest way to a mistake is to duplicate information on a drawing. So when you do that, make sure that you're not contradicting yourself. That's the caveat. But give him as much information as you can. Here's that box again. Keep this one in mind. We're going to talk about gates in a little bit. Here's another one. This one may be a little clearer because it's bigger. I won't spend a lot of time on it, um, but we're doing the same things. Here you can see the slope indications. There are elevations in certain spots, not everywhere, and then all the flat spots are indicated. Give them as much information as you can. Vertical changes in level. Beware of product claims, and I'm going to broaden this, and there isn't a picture, but I'm going to broaden it anyway because what I mean by product claims is not everything that labels itself as ADA compliant is ADA compliant. Look at this threshold. Building was built two years ago. It has to be UFAS compliant. It's, it's um, housing. 
We've all seen this threshold, right? It's a half inch high. What does it say about a half inch? It's gotta be beveled at one and two. The triangle is one and two. You think that complies? 156 thresholds. Now, I don't know whether they substituted it and the, and the architect missed it. I don't know whether they did not supply it to the architect or maybe they requested a substitution and then installed the wrong thing anyway. I've had cases where, you know, a contractor substituted something three times and then installed the fourth option. So be careful with that. Showers. To my knowledge, there's only one prefab shower that you can lay on a slab and have that half inch maximum. I did this because one of the first projects we did for the housing agency was a 20 year old building 18 stories high. They had no as built drawings at all. And we had to lay showers on that. I said, I'll be damned if I'm touching this slab. So I looked and looked and looked and looked. Most prefab showers have plywood reinforcement on the bottom and it thickens it most often to about three quarters. <laughs> I found one that was at five eighths actually, but because I had eighth inch VCT going down on the floor, that gave me my half and we used it. We did everything we could on the drawings, including notes that said, Caution on shower substitution. Any substitution must be approved by the architect before product is purchased. There are extremely limited choices. I attended the pre-bid meeting. I said the same thing to the bidders that were there. They bid the project. I attended the pre-construction meeting. I said the same thing to the con contractor with the plumber there. They bought an ADA approved shower. It had a two inch curb. So God says, here's, oh, by the way, they did not submit it for my approval. Although they said it was the one I approved. Really? Let me see it. They gave me the product sheet. It said ADA compliant, small print, under limited circumstances in certain conditions. I said, damn, the manufacturer's got that shop drawing review stamp down. I did it, I reviewed it, but I'm not responsible for it. So be careful with it because I still have not found one that fits that bill. There are a lot many others that do, but I haven't found one that really fits that bill. And in, in UFAS, one of the problems that these guys are having is that the roll-in shower is 30 by 60. Now HUD has let in and said that they'll accept up to 58 and a half. But if you buy a 30 by 60 pan, prefab pan, by the time you subtract the width of the vertical upturn on the pan, and the cove that's formed by the manufacturing process, you're below 58 and a half inches and it's measured on the floor, face to face, okay? And so every one of theirs is like 57. I don't know what they're gonna do. 156 showers to take out, the building's occupied by the way. Forgot to throw that in. So be careful with product claims. I, I say the same thing to my students about sustainable products. You know, the wonderful sustainable uh, uh, bamboo flooring which is sustainable in every respect except it's shipped from India, or sorry, China. Make a decision for yourself, okay? And with ADA products as well. Recessed doors, here's one you may not have noticed. The underlying text is not in the maneuvering clearance text that used to be in the 91 standards, which is still there, and then they clarified this whole concept of recessed door. Look what it says. It's measured beyond the face of the door, measured perpendicular to the face of the door. So in this case, I'm doing an FHA review, developer building condominiums. They're under construction. They bring me in at framing. They bring me in when the cabinets and drywall and well, the drywall is usually in when they bring me in for framing, but when the cabinets and the fixtures are in, <laughs> and I review it and I'm walking down this corridor and even though this is fair housing, this is the public corridor, so this door from this side has to comply with ANSI A117.1 or whatever safe harbor you pick, ADA, SSDD, right? I looked at this, I said, gee, and I looked at the drawings, six inch, no problem. Somebody assumed maneuvering clearance was there, except for what happened. This wall, well, they didn't really build it this way. That's one of the things that happened, but this is a firewall. So that wall 
is, uh, that's not the right one. Damn it, I put the wrong picture in here. Yep, sorry. That wall there that this is in is an eight inch wall. So the throat of that frame is about seven and a half inches. And it's an in-swing door. So look at the distance to the face of the frame. And then, like I said, it's the wrong picture. I've got to switch it out. This distance is another six inches. So they wound up with 12 and a half inch recess, non-compliant door, because it doesn't have the door swings that way. It, it doesn't have the maneuvering clearance there. Now, they explained it away by saying that they were using spring hinges. They were not using closers, which I did verify with the door schedule, which I had admittedly not looked at. And they'll be fine because a, door, a, a spring hinge is not considered a door closer. So the 12-inch push side was not required. I wish them luck because every fire marshal I've worked with does not like spring hinges uh, because they don't tend to close the door tight always. So I said, as long as you can manage to pull that off, you're OK. But if you've got to put a door closer on here, you have got a major problem. And honestly, this is something that had not occurred to me because it's unusual if you think about it. It happened to be, it looked great on his drawings because it was only intended to be resexed six inches. Now, I don't know how it got changed that this wall is actual double framed, the door that the frame was in and then the build-out that they did, because the build-out actually runs the full length of the corridor. So I don't know where the change occurred, because I haven't seen documentation to that. I've got the permit drawings and then the actual build condition, but that was a problem there. Be careful with that recess doors. Be careful, because that, the, the, the danger is that measure from the face of the door. We're not used to that. We're used to measuring from the face of the wall, because that's all we had in the 91 standards. Yes, sir? Doesn't the, uh, the uh, fire <laughs> Yes. So they're not using a closer on a fire rated wall? No, apparently they can close it with, remember that a, clo a fire rated door doesn't necessarily require a closer. It requires that it be automatically closed and latched. This is where I'm thinking they're going to have problems. But this is my personal experience. I've actually worked with another developer who does them successfully all the time. Now they'll put, this door was a high door, it was an eight foot door. The one, uh, the guy I was talking to, it was, uh, it was a seven foot door. And they use the two, the middle and the bottom hinge with spring. The top hinge they don't, because he was telling me that when they do the top hinge, because the door has a tendency to hang, it messes with the mechanism and it always jams. So they use two, not a single. And they say that they've done it successfully. Like I said, is outside the scope of my investigation. Good luck with that. Yes, sir. The ADA is interpreted as a closer is a closer. Spring hinge is not considered. And there's actually an opinion on that. Uh, Larry was the one that pointed it out to me. Um, I think it was the access board that issued it. The problem with those opinions is federal websites are not really easily navigable. And I have had such hard trouble when I'm looking for something that I know exists and I have the accurate name and I do searches for it and I get nothing. So I haven't been able to find it. He told me he'd give it to me the next time he saw me, so we'll see. What about the pool side of the <laughs> Well, this is that, because this is fair housing, the pool side is under fair housing. The maneuvering clearance is not required. That's the only thing that I had. If this had been a hotel, oh, multi poo poo. <laughs> yeah. Because the, what, look, look at what's on the two sides. So this is not an easy fix, but yeah, it, it's, a, it's a condominium residence. Did the spring hinges have uh, ball bearings or? I've seen them with them. They're pretty, I haven't seen the hinges on this yet because the doors were not hung, uh, but I've seen some that are pretty heavy hinges. Yeah, this is not the 299 Home Depot special because that one I can tell you isn't going to close. It certainly isn't going to latch, but it probably won't even draw it closed. My biggest concern is with the volume, air volume changes in this. It's a big building. It's a big, big building. Hey, like I said, outside the scope of my investigation, I called their attention to it and I said, if a closer is added, You've got a problem. But it was an education for me because 
I hadn't thought about it. And I saw it, so I hadn't thought about it. You can imagine the people that don't work with this all the time. So keep in mind that there's little nuances out there that can really mess you up. Maneuvering clearances for door, part duh. This probably looked good on paper. How many times, admit it, we're not gonna rag on you. How many times have you designed a condition like this? I do it all the time. I do it much more smartly now. That door is in the maneuvering clearance, sorry, that water fountain is in the maneuvering clearance of the door. You know how it probably happened? We used to do it all the time when it was a single fountain, right? Now all of a sudden we got the high lows, it's double wide, I'm gonna blame that, <laughs> right? You can't see it, but there's 30, I think it was 37 inches to there. And that's that right side. This is a part we're working on right now. We're not touching the bathrooms, but I am who I am. So I worked up, I said, gee, that one needs 54, 46. So it looks good on paper. Yeah. That one has a fix. Maybe. I'm not sure. This one's going to get moved across the wall. More maneuvering clearance problems. That little doohickey is a card thing in the laundry at the public housing thing where you charge the, you stick your card in to charge it with money so you can use the card for the washers and dryers. That's a door. I know the door swung out of the picture, but look at the closer to prove that I'm not making stuff up. And that's the pull side. Oops. You'll see this one again. That one's also a protruding object because it's just over 27 inches. It's like 28 inches off the floor. <laughs> yes. But it's in the maneuvering clearance. This was 11 and a half, 12 inches. Stupid stuff that you don't think about. Now we'll see another one. Oh no, before we do that, remember the gate drawing? Gates are doors too. See how much maneuvering clearance there is here? Look at that one. Look at that one. This one's even better. That's on a spring hinge so it auto closes. Actually, I think this one might actually have a closer. Magnetic lock, the release. Look at the distance between the release and the door. Now, this is technically not on ADA, but imagine some elderly person in a wheelchair. That's a very busy avenue on the other side of that gate. And it's like, get ready, push that button, release the door, haul ass before it closes. Things you just don't think about. No maneuvering clearance, no maneuvering clearance, no maneuvering clearance, no maneuvering clearance. Now, to be fair, one of those doesn't need it because it has spring hinges. So, but to illustrate a point, because people don't consider gates doors, oddly enough. Some people. Ah, yes. The ever popular bent railing. Handrail extensions must continue in the direction of stair travel. Let me zoom ahead a little bit. That came into play with existing buildings where extending that handrail would have run across and narrowed the means of egress, the path of egress. Focus on narrow, not inconvenience you. I've whacked my knee an awful lot of times and other parts of my body I don't care to discuss on these handrail extensions. They're an inconvenience. But the rule says it can only be done this way when, it's, uh, when it would otherwise create a safety hazard by narrowing the path of egress. This is new construction. It's hard to see because it's small. By the way, this one, I have no clue why they did that. Because this is the ground floor. This is the exit out. There is nothing there. And this is a railing to keep you from walking back underneath the stair. Did a draftsman just think that was cute? An architect missed it. Now, fortunately, they caught it. The actual site did not get built that way. Yeah. The one on the left, I was peer reviewing. Remember that first drawing I said how much I hated? Same project. 
I submitted the comments to the architect. The architect of record ultimately has to either incorporate or tell me to go to hell. Okay? You're the architect of record. I'm not saying that I'm going to tell you to do this if you don't want to. This poor guy, I don't know if he was having a bad day, but the response that was communicated to me was, and I should preface it by saying that this is a large design build operation. Okay? I'm not making this up except that I am giving you the tone of voice as I think it may have come out of his mouth. Well, as the AOR, we've been doing these successfully all over the state, and in fact, outside the state, all over the country. Okay. My response was, you've been doing them all wrong. Good luck with that. Now, why do I bring this up? I'm not trying to aggrandize myself. <laughs> Remember what I said, curiosity and design? That could have been very easily designed out. Okay, that stairwell could have been a little longer if in fact it needed to be, because in a couple of these locations, this distance is long enough that I would argue that a 12 inch extension of that handrail would not have narrowed the path around it below the minimum requirements. But how would you like to be the architect if it gets a call from your client when that client's been served with an ADA lawsuit because among other things, the handrail extension was improperly placed when you know that the owner previously hired a peer reviewer who told you that that was incorrectly done and all you did was say, well, I've done them that way successfully for a long time. Don't call me, I will not be your expert. I may be the expert on the other side. It's just silly, why do you not incorporate advice that's given to you? That was the attitude he took. This one, as I said, got built correctly. But wait, the plot thickens. This drawing was reviewed about a year ago. Eh, eight, eight months or so ago. I added this one because it's the same architect. It sailed across my desk about three weeks ago. I don't know. Same condition, first floor, nowhere to go. Here they didn't have the return rail, so the other thing they haven't accounted for is somebody sneaking up underneath and bumping their head on the, on the stair where it hits 80, degree, 80 uh, inches, but hey, I just thought I'd add, this was a last minute ad. it may or may not be in the one you have because it literally is that recent. The point is when you've been given construction, constructive information incorporated, this, I am sure this is just a drafting mistake. They may have a standard detail for stairs that only gets modified slightly from building to building because they have a lot of buildings like this, not exactly the same. I don't know. I added this one because of something interesting. It's not really a violation, but um, I thought it'd be interesting to share with you because I could see this happening. This happens to be the roof landing. Forget that. Let's assume this is the upper landing of a stair in your building and you go ahead and you place the safeguard across that landing as you're required to. That's there. But you decide to extend the railing, uh, the handrail, along that guardrail, even though you don't have to. That's fine. You don't have to, more power to you. Go for it, more power. But when those railing shop drawings come back, if the railing guy caught it and decided to cheapen the project by removing that handrail, which he can do, make sure you catch it. Because if they remove that handrail and they finish it like that, you have a violation. So I just put it on there to show you that you've got to look at this stuff. With ADA compliance, if a big chunk of it occurs during construction, your responsibility to review submittals is a little more enhanced. Now, Having said that, I'm quite aware of the fact that, you know, your review of the submittals doesn't constitute a waiver of the, you know, the contractor's duty to conform to the drawings. So, but take that with a grain of salt. Six months later, I controlled myself. I didn't write what I wanted to write. I just marked it and said, handrails must continue. Remember the AOR that's been doing this successfully around the country? Here's the actual built condition. Yeah.
yeah, my retirement plan. But don't worry, all architects are ADA experts. I got, you know, I didn't think about this. How if Tony comes to the Miami seminar so I can, I'm not gonna call him out, but I'm gonna be emphatic. <laughs> if he doesn't, I'm gonna save these pictures and share it with him. That's what got built. I was in Orlando for something else a couple of weeks ago. I took the time to go over there now that it's completed and look at it and sure enough. Now they did correct some of them. Uh, the one that's actually in the drawing, on the drawing that I showed you was corrected. But there's three stairways in this thing. I went and looked at the others. Apparently the correction on the one that they did do was an accident. Because all the others are, these are the three others. Yep, I love my work. This, was, this is existing, I think. Larry's, Larry took this picture, so I'm not sure. Um, this one was brand new, another one of those housing projects. And they turned the thing. I am sure they thought that they had run out of room and they had to because the sidewalk was there. I am also sure nobody bothered to see whether they could move the sidewalk, expand the sidewalk, whether extending it into the sidewalk narrowed the width of the sidewalk unsafely. <coughs> they just bent it because they've done it successfully so many times before. Be careful with this. This is very, very common. <coughs> and what can you do on your drawings to prevent this? Absolutely nothing other than not show them the way the drawings I just put up showed them. You could probably write a note that clarifies it, but they are probably going to ignore it just as much as they ignored my advice when I reviewed it. So this is not one of those, but be aware of this because it's happening. And if you're one of those that sometimes wonders about whether I should do this on a project because space is tight, you're not supposed to if it's on a newly designed project because you're supposed to have the ability to design accessibly, which is another, a nice way of saying design around it. <coughs> There may be a circumstance where there's absolutely no other choice. You're going to have to make that call. But do it in a manner where you can document why you had to make that call. So if it's ever questioned, you've got that information. And you should document it in the project file somewhere. There was just nothing else I could do, whatever the, the reason is. This one, you know, the landing up above was longer than it needed to be. The landing could have been shortened to pull the lower step back a little bit. The sidewalk um, is on a driveway but it's about a six foot sidewalk, so the, in combination of maybe widening it a little bit and, and pulling that back, you know, it, something could have been done. Remember that the rule now is 12 inches from the, the, the top riser. So there's almost 12 inches there. You're almost there. It, it's, it's as if it was bent unnecessarily. I would argue that that cost more. Because every time they bend one of those things, I don't like how they turn the corners. Protruding objects. I don't need slides. This is not 80 inches. Look at the door. Is this in the circulation path? I don't know. Somebody's going to say it is. That one's not bad. Look at the one in the back of the room. They stuck a tree under it. I guess they ran out of trees. <laughs> what I recommend to my clients when they're putting something down to, to give a warning of an obstruction is make sure it's permanent. Because what you don't know is when the maintenance staff comes in to sweep this or vacuum this room after we're done, whether they're going to move that tree somewhere else. So this is very difficult. And here's one right there. This is an exercise room. In this instance, I called it out because in my opinion, you can walk along here. The guy says, well, how do I fix that? Because you didn't call it out on the others. Yes, on the others, the exercise equipment was up closer to it. And in my opinion, you cannot walk through there. You turned it into a non-circulating path. The biggest issue is when you get into bathrooms. We'll talk about that. In, I think it's the next slide. This one I let go. Oh, sorry, not this one. That's a little hand dryer outside the bathroom in the vestibule. I don't know. Do not ask the obvious question. Not a clue. But you can see it is in the maneuvering clearance of the door. But it doesn't have a latch. But it is pull, so I need 18. It only sticks out just below four, three and seven eighths. I could go either way on this. If it's that close to the wall, it's not a protruding object. I would argue it's probably not on the circulating path. 
if I were defending this client and we wound up in court, I'd say, if you wheel up to this door like you need to in a wheelchair, you would never be, that would never be in your way. Technically, it's a violation. There should be nothing in that maneuvering clearance. But I let it go because of all of the reasons I just laid out. You need to make that call. Now, if you showed that on your drawings, <laughs> okay? Because a lot of this stuff just doesn't get shown on the drawings. Here's that card again. This is also a door. It's a different condition than the one before. This is also a door. It's in the pool clearance. The client changed that out. The architect had correctly specified the shallow basket that doesn't project more than four inches. The client put that in there. The building official caught it when they came out. The fire inspector caught it when they came out because it was in the maneuvering clearance of an accessible route, the door. So the other bathroom, they had switched it to the shallow one. They said, no, what? take a picture of the other one. I said, no, 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 I want to take a picture of that one too because if nothing else, it's going to wind up on a presentation. Here, by the way, well, I'll come back to that. Here I would argue that it's not in the circulation path to the lab because the clear floor space of the lab doesn't have to be centered on it in ADA. So if this thing were just enough to the side that I could justify that your maneuvering clearance or your, your clear floor space for the lab was clear of it, you know, and it met all the other requirements like detectable, I would say it's not, maybe it's not even in the circulation path because you're not likely to walk to the corner like I just did. Okay, now, here's why that, to me, would be a violation. Right now, it's empty. But I'm having a party here tonight, and they're going to bring in rounds. And I'm bringing a lot of people, so this room is going to be filled with round tables. I guarantee you there'll be one in that corner. So now, to get to that round table, to the seats at that round table, I'm now circulating underneath that TV. This is what you have to consider. Because I'm sure whoever put it up in the corner said it's out of the way there. In some cases, yes, it is. I just described one where it's not. These mirrors, the wedge, find anywhere on any published document. You can go into the outer reaches of space where it says that that's compliant. It's not. Some manufacturer thought it was a great idea for existing buildings where it was still not compliant, where somehow you couldn't lower the mirror. I'm not sure what would keep you from lowering the mirror, but I never say never because there's always an opportunity that avails itself. Let me reset my timer here. <coughs> Very important. <laughs> this is a new building. They're all over the place. This thing was, I think if I remember correctly, 49 inches or 48 inches above the floor. It still has to be 40 inches. Guess what happens when you put that bottom of that mirror at 40 inches and it's a wedge? I can't see my face. I can't wait for an owner to say, well, if we had put it lower, you wouldn't be able to see your face. And I do have some tall owners because that's when I'm going to say, well, who said it had to be wedged? I'm sure he's going to say the architect or don't use them. They're more expensive. This one's fixed. This one's not one of those that has the fancy little flip down hinge, which scare me because those things break. But ah, where's the circulation path? Here's my favorite paper towel dispenser. So there it is. This situation, as I said a few minutes ago while we waited for the technical difficulties, I would probably say that that dispenser was in the circulation path because of the narrowness of the space. There's a couple of things. The picture's limited. You can see the toilet is here. So it's a tight space already. You can get the clear floor space for the lab, which doesn't have to be centered by offsetting it a little bit. And the reality is you're not offsetting it. The person using it is going to use it in the best, in the most comfortable way to them. So they're going to handle the offset for you, OK? But this is nine inches of projection. And I suspect there's not many ways that you could get to that lab without bumping into that. So that one I would consider to be in the circulation path for that reason, even though it does not obstruct the clear floor space directly. Here's one where the distance is a little bit more reasonable. And I would argue that you know, the clear floor space is clearly provided. Slide over a little bit if you have to, but you're pretty darn close to being centered at it anyway. 
What you don't see in this picture is that the door is off to the left. So when you come into this room, your natural path to this would not take you past this. So that's not in the circulation path. But it is difficult. And what you need to do when you're designing, particularly, is be cautious of that and dimension it. Here's one, and there's another one on the next one that makes it even more. Here's that same door again. Um, in this instance, this is clearly in the circulation path and the maneuvering clearance for the door because that door is a strike side approach. So the user is coming this way. That's the circulation path. If this thing is more than four inches, which it is, and higher than 27, it's a protruding object. This one I love. They did put the garbage can under it so that the protruding object issue is resolved, except that's not permanent trash can. But even though you don't really need the maneuvering clearance for the stall doors like you do for a regular door, in some instances you do, clearly this is in the circulation path to get to that stall. And the one on the left is kind of like the one we just looked at in the tightness of it, but I also showed it for the swing of the door. Remember that the doors cannot swing over the clear floor space of any fixture. And there it does. And if you offset the, well, I don't think you could offset the clear floor space enough to get out of the door, but if you did, you'd run into the paper towel. So this is a potpourri of nonconformances. You know, it's like, hey, I promised exciting content, right? There it is. Take a look at this. Remember when that used to be six inches maximum from here? I'm still seeing that on drawings. And this is what is measured now, 12 inches from there to here. Now it doesn't say from that side, it says 12 inches to one side, 24 to the other. Common sense would dictate that it's 12 inches this way or 24 to the other, unless you've got some magic trick I'm not aware of. Be careful with this, I'm still seeing the other one. Yes, sir. Show the center line of the left of the toy. Yes, sir. So the toilet has to be 18 inches from the wall. Yes, sir. And the, and the grab bar has to extend 12 inches beyond the center line of the toilet towards that wall. It's, and it doesn't say towards the wall, but it says to one side, but that's the only side that that can happen. <laughs> Here's another one that's confusing in how it's presented. So we all know the 42 inch sidewall bar, right? 12 inch maximum. So 10 inches should be enough, right? Yes. 54 inch minimum. If you're at 10 with a 42 inch grab bar, you're at 52. So you could be a 44 inch grab bar at 10 if you can find one, custom make it. I've had custom grab bars made, usually for longer, because I had a bathroom condition where um, I opened up the shower. So the only way to get the turnaround, it's a hotel bathroom in a historic building. The only way to get the turnaround in the shower was to allow the turnaround to occur over the shower. So I did an open-ended shower on that side. The shower bar, by the time you brought it to six inches from where the sidewall would have been, and the 36-inch grab bar for the water closet, which was the next fixture over, they would have come very close to each other to the point where I figured the flanges would have been knocking sides. So I told the owner to go get a custom, I think it was 80, 82, 83-inch grab bar, and it's just one continuous grab bar and it worked great. But be careful with this, because this is pretty common. And what happens is when you, when you work solely from the old dimension of 12 inch maximum, you're gonna wind up, if, if it's anything less than 12, you're gonna wind up short. Toilet paper dispensers. They are now measured, they, they made my life hard, because to measure this, in the field is so much harder than measuring the distance from the furthest extension to the back wall. The center line of the dispenser needs to be within the range of seven to nine inches from the furthest projection of the toilet. Which means you get to touch the toilet, which I don't like to do. <laughs> Here's the other thing that can get you in trouble. 15 inches minimum above the floor, 48 inches maximum means that that dispenser can be over the grab bar. This is another reason why I hate those pages. That would be on that page. The problem is that you have to maintain 12 inch minimum clearance above that grab bar. Eh. 
These are also Larry's pictures. This is the best one. I don't know what the dimension is because I didn't have his notes, but clearly it's over the grab bar. This is an inspection I did two weeks ago. Five inches out from the wall and it was eight, I think, above the grab bar. So I told the owner, just put it underneath. I don't know why you have to have it on the top of the grab bar. Maybe the guy who installed it didn't want to bend over. I don't know. Biggest problem he has is it's only 48 inches from there to the lab in both single user lavatories in that bathroom. And I'm like, oh man, I hate to tell you this, but you got to grow this bathroom somehow. And, I, and there, I, I can't figure out where to put that sink to allow the 60 inches and not have it sink it in the way of something else because it's that small. This was built under the 91 standards. I'm sitting here going, who missed that boat? Because it shouldn't have been missed. The one on the left I showed because the 60 by, six, the 60 by 56 rule says that nothing shall be within that space other than the grab bars and the toilet dispensers and other dispensers that are appropriate to the use of the toilet. So sanitary uh, napkin dispensers and disposals, toilet paper, that's about all I can think of would fit, and the grab bars would fit in there. This is the waste can for the toilet, for the uh, paper towel dispenser to the sink that's just off camera. And I know some architect is going to try and tell me that disposal is for sanitary napkins, and I'm going to say uh, no. So be careful with that. What's your role in this? If you're showing the locations, dimension them. Don't show them graphically and expect them to, to scale the drawings because they're not supposed to scale the drawings. And when they do, it's always to your disadvantage. So if you're showing them, dimension them. That's, that's my only advice. It may not stop them from doing that, but at least you're covered. ADA is about fine-tuning, picky-ass stuff. Here's one of my drawings. Uh, I should have blown it up just because I didn't realize, I wanted to show the context of the room not realizing that it was going to be even harder to read than it is when it's full scale or when it's, you know, in, in live. Look at, we always, you ought to be using a separate, even if it's a separate drawing that only shows the clearances, you ought to have a separate larger scale drawing of the accessible stall so you can show all of this stuff and how it works together. And I had several conversations with my guys about not putting the, the paper towel dispenser in the 60 inches, and they finally, finally got rid of it. But what can you do? This is the level of detail that you ought to show. This is the stuff that that comment sheet doesn't show. Because there are one, two, three, four, five, maybe six different elements that are separate on that sheet that have to be pulled together in a way that works for that room. And only you can do that. The contractor isn't going to be able to do that. <coughs> this was kind of an interesting one because this shower is bigger than the minimum accessible shower and the building official couldn't deal with that. So I added this. It's a, it's a coach's shower. So there's actually um, two heads in that shower room. And I said, well, yeah, but the whole thing has to be accessible. No. This 30 inches of it is accessible. Because he went a grab bar all the way across that shower. I go, hell no. It was the plumbing reviewer, which I would question why you're reviewing accessibility. Probably inherited it because plumbing fixtures have to be accessible. But you have to question whether they really had accessibility training. There's that picture again. Why is that picture here again? Oh, look out for in-swinging doors across some lavatories. This is the whole door swing shouldn't be over the clear floor space of the, of the fixtures. That is what the text is here, but I talked to you about it in the previous slide, so that's why it seems like an inevitable repeat. Here's one you may not have ever heard about, um, but it happens. The code says, the ADA says, that it's 34 inches maximum height, 
to the countertop or the rim of the lavatory, whichever is higher. Look at that picture. Self-rimming labs can add as much as three quarters of an inch of height. This contractor did not get that. He's going to be adjusting an awful lot of cabinets. What happens on our drawings that makes, that makes this pervasive? We don't call it out. Let me see if I've got that drawing. No. We dimension it when we've got that detail. And we've got that dimension string going out there that almost always appears to look like it's connecting to the top of the counter, whether you intended it to be to the, to the uh, rim of the lab or not. But at 3 eighths of an inch scale, 3 quarters of an inch ain't much. And the plotter is going to lose that. You don't get that precision output from the devices that are printing drawings. So it gets missed. You need to call it out with a little note on the side that says measure to the rim or the countertop. Or put it on a side note somewhere and just put a numerical key to that and put it somewhere on the drawing. If you've got a larger detail, which these guys actually do because this is another one of those UFAS projects. And UFAS requires, like ADA, requires frontal approach to labs. But it also allows you to have removable base cabinets. So all of these cabinets are removable base. So he's got that detailed and larger scale even to show the removable portions. And he still calls the 34 inches to the countertop. So it's a miss. So the moral of the story is you may not always be doing a larger scale detail that would allow you to show that graphically. Don't rely on the graphics. Whenever you look at something in ADA and you're, if you're relying solely on the graphics in ADA, you are in a deep, deep well. You've got to read the accompanying text because the ADA graphics aren't great either. Although the 2010 graphics are a hell of a lot better than the 91 graphics. Those were really bad. So you've got to look at that. You know, grab bars are now measured to the top gripping surface. In the 91 standard, they were measured to the center line, except you couldn't tell that because the graphics were bad. So be careful with this because this poor guy is changing an awful lot of counters and labs. Yes. <coughs> clearance for what? Yes, but it happens when this gets removed. This entire cabinet from here down pulls out when it's needed and then they can pull in. Now, they also happen, it's not part of, the, of the, what we're presenting, but they also happen to have this set up so we're, uh, more often than not that bottom is too low when they remove it. And it's like at about 26 and a half or 26, and it needs to be 27. The curious thing about UFAS, which I have not been able to get a response from US HUD about, is that UFAS has, um, well, UFAS has never been updated. From back when my grandmother helped, you know, blow on the ink to get it to dry. So it's a combination of the bad graphics and the out of date concepts and all of this good stuff that comes into play in an amazing way. And so UFAS has a, under dwelling units, it has a requirement that for countertops, the overall thickness of the countertop cannot be more than two inches, including the structure of the countertop. It says that you have to have, I believe it says that you have to have knee, provide knee clearance. And then outside of 34 in section 4.2, 19 or 17 or one of those where it talks about lavatories not necessarily in a dwelling unit it says that you got to have 27 for knee clearance and 29 to the underside of the rim and but it draws a wall hung graphically a wall hung lav and says nothing about that 29 inch dimension except for the call out on the drawing and I'm like okay so if I take this to be non-specific to a wall hung lav, it means that I've got to have 29 inches under the rim. Well, what's the rim? Let's say it's the countertop. But that's a useless measurement because if this thing is there, that countertop only projects about 3 quarters of an inch from the face. And then there's that whole thing about the countertop can only be 2 inches thick overall, which means that if that were a 34, you'd have 32 inches under there. And then it says, provide knee clearance, which is 27. 
So I wrote a letter. I said, hey, which one is it? I'm still waiting for my response. HUD does not like to answer. It just does not. So I'm like, I told the contractors that are building these, the developers that are developing these units, because Dade County's gone into a, a sort of a triple P situation where they bring developers in to redevelop their existing low, low income housing sites. It's working out great. I'm looking forward to becoming a, a, a ward of the state and living in one of these apartments because they are five star hotels in some of the best parts of town. So it's like I'm, I'm getting in good with them so I can call dibs on where I want to live when I get to it. But the point is that all these developers are out there designing these things. I'm certifying them because that's my role. I'm supposed to be the certifying agent. And I don't know what to certify to because the standards are confusing. And I would argue contradictory. 32 versus 29 versus 27. I feel like I should call a play. Yeah. <laughs> ah, what a marvelously thought out question. I understood that to be the intent when the 2010 standards were written, and you'll, you know the 2010 standards now include dwelling units, which they did not before, but it's the whole interagency thing. So it's still out there. And it is the craziest, most bizarre thing. Ideally, that should have been sunset and FHA maybe not because FHA doesn't really require full accessibility, it's adaptability. So there's a role for that, um, but yeah, I don't know. It certainly was, as I understood it, that was the intent, but it never has. And so this agency is stuck complying with UFAS. And they won't even let them technically on the new projects use the new ADA standards, which now allow 16 to 18 on the toilet. UFAS is still 18. I'll tell you another thing. Oh, listen, it confuses me, and I supposedly know this stuff. Here's another thing I just ran into that I never thought of, honest to God. I'm, I'm looking at all these projects, and all of a sudden I'm finding grab bars. The grab bars are supposed to have an inch and a half exactly from the inside face of the grab bar to the opposite to the wall. I've got grab bars that are two inches, inch and five eighths, inch and three quarters, and I'm looking at it to see if there was anything in the installation that pushed it out. And there's nothing. The flanges are tied up against the wall. There's nothing that would show that there's a warp in the wall or anything that gave me a foul reading, except that the manufacturer's tolerances are not there. And I told the developer, I said, you got to be careful. I, I would have never thought to look for that. Never. Now, I always specify Bobrick because I like Bobrick. I'm familiar with the brand. I trust them, I think. But I don't know what they install because Bobrick's not the cheapest game in town. But somebody out there is manufacturing grab bars that are more than an inch and a half from the, from the back end of the flange. Hello? So I told the developer, I said, man, you, um, I'm not sure how to tell you to do this, but I told the architect, I said, I would be damn sure to do a large grab bar detail and put one and a half inch exactly, just to cover your butt. So talk about, watch, what, you know, watch how they brand things that are compliant. I really, I have not fully investigated what the hell's going on. Because quite honestly, it would take too much work for me to ask him to tell me where they all came from. I'm sure they're multiple brands. Because I would hope the manufacturing tolerances within a single company are not so bad that you get one and a half, one and three quarter, one and five eighths and two inches. You'd have to question the company. Here's something to be careful with, boys and girls. Obstructed high reach. When objects have to be reached over counters, such as outlets or switches, they need to be lower. But there's also a maximum to that reach. And there's never a counter around. Ah, oh, there is a counter around. If you measure it, I'm going to go off camera again. <laughs> this is what Robin Williams used to do. He used to chase around on stage so that the cameraman would have to follow him and it would drive them crazy. If you measure it to here, the face of the backsplash, you're going to get a dimension that you might be happy with. And maybe it's 24. But the switch isn't on the backsplash, the switch is on the wall. You measure to the wall? Uh-oh. So look at that dimension. This is 25. And that would seem like that's fine. Look at what ADA says. 25 is fine for high forward reach, 
but in a kitchen, and particularly this location, there's no pull-up counter underneath it. You're going to do a side reach. At side reach, that comes down to 24 max. And I asked, at the last time I walked through the fair housing one, which is not this project, it's a different one, we were having the same conversation. They brought their cabinet guy in so I could give him direction on what to look out for. And I asked him, when did base cabinet boxes start being built at a full 24 inches? Because I remember they were 22. The box was 22. It allowed for about three quarters of an inch overhang for the countertop. It allowed for a little fudge space in the back so you could, you know, space it if you had to, put a nailer on the wall, do your thing, and put a countertop on it and still be at 24 for the counter. I have counters on these projects that are 26 and a half inches deep. I got one that's 27. I go, what the hell? Yeah. Well, uh, part of the problems in residential is you can't put a uh, uh, 12 inch blade on a 12 inch deep upper cabinet. So some custom homes require to have like a 14 inch upper cabinet so you can put nicer, larger plates and then you end up put, pulling out the bottom. But uh, I think that's the reason why they start Maybe. deeper. Maybe. Well, uh, the other question I have for you, which goes along with this, you can put what they call a garage, which is a, it's a place that it's uh, like a shelf where you can place yeah. uh, uh, certain uh, blenders and yeah. things of that sort. An appliance garage, yeah. That uh, rectifies some of these issues? Was it for fair housing, it's the reach to that outlet. Okay. So if that outlet is pulled forward, yes. I think what happened, honestly, and the guy sort of nodded his head knowingly, but I know from the nod that he didn't know what the hell he was talking about. I think they became 24 inches when this all modularized, when they started bringing in the European cabinets, because that's, that's a, there's a very close equivalent to 24 inches in metric. And a lot of those systems that were first brought in were European in nature. And I think that's when the boxes became 24. So now the problem is 24 plus a little installation fudge plus the overhang of the counter, you're 26. Just one more question. Uh, can you uh, put an outlet inside a drawer that you can pull out and use that? Uh, maybe to correct the problem like that? Just well, I think what you have to look out for is it depends on what the applicable standard is. In fair housing, all the outlets don't have to be within accessible reach if there's another outlet in, this, in that area. So in a kitchen situation, if you've got one that's within reach, because I've had questions about outlets in corners where the cabinets come to an edge. When you take that diagonally to an outlet that's way over by the corner, uh, you know, no matter, even if the counter's 24, you're going to exceed your reach. Um, but in a situation where they all have to be accessible, they would all have to be within that reach. If you put it on something that, I suppose, if you put it on something that you could pull out and the pullout itself was accessible, I think you could defend that. You know, but, but I always tell my clients, when I tell you that I think you can defend that, it implies that you're already being sued. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's going to be the next, the next challenge. It's going to be with the electrical inspector. Um, but, I mean, honestly, I think that, um, I'm not sure how you fix it, you know? He has some units that are close enough that I told him, just get a plate extender on it and push the plate out and get yourself into compliance because the ones where he's not in compliance, it's a pretty significant fix, just you know? the height of the uh, backsplash and mount it to the face of the backsplash. That's the simplest thing. And, and in most cases, residentially, I, I, I like to use full height backsplashes anyway, so I probably wouldn't have that problem, except if I had a 24-inch box that then got a, you know, a one-inch overhang on it, eh, you could still be in trouble. But yes, I normally go with a full backsplash, so I don't run into that problem. But I have had backsplash when I've done barrier removal for, for low-income housing where they've removed the backsplash and, and gone to just a shortened uh, backsplash, and then we run into trouble because you, you take that safety margin out. But that's the easy fix. Um, I just, I, I really wanted this cabinet guy to tell me why all of a sudden they're building him at 24. And, you know, it was almost like he said, because we want to. Uh, but I really think it's the modularization, because nobody builds a cabinet by hand anymore. You know, even the smallest shops basically have jigs that they have bought, and they cut to the jigs, and the jigs are all set to whatever the standard was that they were built from. 
and this is how you wind up with this. When you overlay all of the fudge factors that we put into our designs to allow for the incompetence of the construction work itself, meaning shims, uh, you know, you name it, leveling space, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you wind up with this condition, and I just don't think anybody had called it to their attention, but I'm like, whoa. That, the first one I saw was the one that was at 27, and I'm like, holy cow. It's a pass-through. So I'm sitting here trying to figure out why are we in a pass-through situation? Why are we three inches further out than the wall? I have not got a clue. The only time I've ever done that is when there is, I did it in my own house when we did the kitchen because I wanted to build in space for one of those um, up and down exhaust fans behind the range. And I bought IKEA cabinets, so I'm stuck with the module. And I said, okay, fine. Uh, just pull the base cabinets forward three inches. We'll build a cavity back there for that thing. It drove everyone nuts. You want to what? What? Hey, how are you? Just follow, the, follow directions. So I do have a deeper cabinet, but, you know, but it is an island, so it doesn't, you don't get into the reach issues. But I don't know. So what now? Well, <laughs> design wisely and build carefully. Details, details, details. What I want you to take away from this is a consideration that there are things that you can do on your drawings to at least cover yourself, if not actually help mitigate issues that happen in construction when people that don't know the, um, the detail-oriented tightness of tolerances that you're dealing with. Now, more so when you're dealing with something that is specifically accessible or doing barrier removal where you're actually trying to correct prior uh, issues. But even in new construction, there are certain things you're always going to run into. If you're doing hotels, you're going to run into it. If you're doing, you know, if you're doing retail stores and stuff like that where those bathrooms are generally what I would call a vanilla bathroom, you're not going to run into some of these problems. You still run into the mirrors being too high because nobody seems to comprehend the, the concept of measure it to the bottom reflected surface. I actually had some guy argue with me that the stainless steel frame was reflective. And it is. So I had, I had difficulty arguing back. And I said, yeah, but I'm going to call reflective the mirrored surface, you know? But it is reflective, you know? So this guy, he, he was wise. He says, well, what, if, what about a, a prison one where it's all a stainless steel polished plate? I said, it's not a prison. See ya. <laughs> I walked out. Somebody was going to say something. Why didn't you throw him a bone? I, Right, I mean, if he's clever enough to come up with an argument that he hadn't come up with before. He, he was clever. Sense. Yeah. Well, I, I have honestly seen some where I've questioned it myself. But the fact is that those stainless steel frames, they, um, they get bad. Of course, I could also say that the mirror coating on the back of the glass also gets bad. So, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a circular argument. If you want to argue with yourself for a while, it's a good, good argument to have. Um, I, I, I think that... Um, the problem is that, and every time that I deal with an owner or with a contractor about correcting things, I generally get the same response. I didn't realize it was that tight. I didn't realize it was that picky. I didn't realize, I didn't realize, I didn't realize. Um, accessible tables. Oh, those sexy pedestal tables. I've never met one that complies because you don't have the pull-in ranges. Every once in a while, I'll stumble into somebody that gets lucky because they'll do two or three in a row to get a longer table and there's enough gap between the pedestals that you can pull in. Other than that, nah. The accessible tables are not sexy, they're four posters. Hey, <laughs> deal with it, right? So, eh, little things like that that you have to, you just have to live with. Building tolerances whenever you can. Allow for finishes with dimensions. One of the things I run into a lot, in the housing particularly, because the typical kitchen you know the layout. You walk in the door, there's a little corridor, the kitchen's to the left, you get into the dining room and then into the, di into the living room. And at some point, <clears throat> if it's not a peninsula, which are now in fashion, there's a wall that catches the end of the kitchen cabinet and there's a choke point there to the wall opposite the, the, the hall, which maybe is the bedroom or the bathroom, and it's 36 inches. That gets measured at the floor. So we're gonna blame the interior designer. The interior designer came in and put a fancy inch and a quarter thick base, and all of a sudden your 36 inch corridor just became whatever 36 minus two and a half inches is, 33, 33 and a half. <laughs> now it's still compliant, because you can go down to 32, mm -hmm. as long as it doesn't go more than 24. And guess what? You remember that 27 inch cabinet? The one that comes into the end of that wall, plus a little bit to carry the countertop that it extends, you know, it's 30 inches, it's 36 inches. And those are the things that get missed a lot. 
I had a huge case in Orlando. It was fair housing. Huge, huge case. Because it was a thousand some odd units in this complex. And the owner was a REIT that had a thousand plus sites around the country. And the plaintiff wanted them to have all, wanted the court to force them to inspect them all. And one of the issues was in the bathroom over the 48 inch requirement to approach the um, bathtub. And the setup was bathtub, space, toilet. That was the square off of the room. And they were narrow by the base. They were an inch short. And I had prepared, the uh, attorney was convinced we were going to go to court. And I, prepared, I used my 3D software, my Revit, to generate a 3D model of the, of the area. And I dropped a um, um, wheelchair into it. And I tried to explain, had I needed to, to the court, that measuring it along the floor, although clear floor space would imply that that's where you measure it, is really not the appropriate way to measure it because in reality the roundness of wheels will never allow a wheelchair to get quite up to that baseboard because the back wheel of most wheelchairs, now they've got smaller ones that have tighter diameters, but those things are 30 inch diameter, maybe more. So you got 15 inches of, of wheel circumference up the wall before it touches where the base isn't. And the same thing on the other side. And unfortunately, the attorney was really good. He got the case kicked out. First time in my ADA history I ever saw a case kicked out of court, and I never got to go to court. But I so wanted to go there and try and prove this out, because I do think that with all due respect to the reason we do this, and we're all getting there. You know, my favorite example was with everybody used to bitch about lever doors, lever handles. And I'm like, look, I'm one of those guys, because I think this is a guy thing, where I come back from the grocery store and if I've got 27 plastic bags, I am going to find ways to hang 27 bags on my fingers because I'll be damned if I'm going back for a second trip. And now you're coming up on the door, what do you do? A lever is a wonderful thing, right? So with all due respect to that, we do have a tendency to get a little too far over the edge. And I thought this was one of those where it's like, why are we picking on an inch? At this particular point, it wasn't the whole bathroom when the likelihood of, of the wheelchair ever coming in contact with this is nil. But I didn't get to prove it, so live to fight another day. And then choose materials wisely. Um, be careful with materials that, uh, you know, try and use materials that require less exactitude and try and predict what a material might do as it sets, like concrete. And understand, this is where I talk about the tolerances. If you're dealing with concrete and you know the concrete's gonna sort of grow and shrink a little bit and you never know quite in which direction, then go with those tolerances and let the tolerances pick up the slack. Uh, I drive contractors crazy because the grab bar is, what, 33 to 36? And I, I always put them at 34. And everybody wants to know why. But I'm giving serious thought to actually using a whack dimension just to catch their attention. Because it is what catches their attention. You know, you look at 34 and you know, 34 is the same as the height of the counter, you know, so it's like, eh, oh, oh, oh. So that's it. Any questions? Let me get to the any questions slide so that it's official. Thank you. We are at the end of our day. Sir? Are those slides posted, you said, somewhere in your presentation? Say, yeah, they have this PowerPoint on download. Um, I think it's on the registration site. It may be on the AI Florida site. Yes? I, I have a question. How come they don't set a range for countertops? Uh, it just seems so difficult for them to, to get it just right. To hit 34? Yeah, for the countertops. Because, of the, I mean, I don't know. It just seems obvious. I mean, it, if, it, if you apply Murphy's. Yeah, but if you apply Murphy's law and you went, let's say for the sake of argument, you went 33 to 35, it, they, they, yeah, because we can. <laughs> no, I, you know, honestly, I don't know why. It, it may have been considered when, when the new standards were being discussed and it just wasn't adopted. Um, I find I have a curious thing now. One of those projects I showed is actually the, uh, the um, um, basketball team locker rooms for the University of Miami uh, team, basketball team. 
and they wanted to punch it up for recruiting efforts. And one of the most common complaints they had from all of the players, including the ladies basketball team, because we're doing both of them, is that the, the sinks were too low and they wanted to move them up higher. And the, you know, the, the, everybody was worried about ADA. And I said, I gotta have one at 34, the rest you can have wherever you want. And they said, well, where, where would you put them? And I said, well, I would say try 38, but what I'm gonna do is, we're gonna go out there, we're gonna lay a sink down on the existing sink, and I'm gonna jack it up and jack it down until you tell me where you want it, because that's a losing argument. That's kinda like, honey, do I look fat in this dress? <laughs> There's no right answer to that. So I'm like, bring the client in, bring the client in, tell me where you want it, and they're, they're actually doing that supposedly this next week. So, yeah. When you have a stairwell, are you required to have a door clearance, a maneuvering clearance? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Tell me, has anybody ever considered why that would be? Because nobody in a wheelchair would be in a, in a staircase? Probably not in good condition at the bottom. Right. Yes. Yeah, I know. It, it's, it's written for all doors, and so it does apply to stairs. Um, I, I do think that in a certain sense, I don't think maneuvering clearances, although they are primarily for people in wheelchairs, I don't think they're beneficial exclusively to people in wheelchairs. I've often wondered whether Considering what maneuvering clearance is supposed to do, if this, well, let's use that door. If that door, which has a panic bar, um, did not have maneuvering clearance, would that be detrimental to the use of that door uh, by someone with a wheelchair when, you know, it's primarily to be able to get to the door, operate it, swing it, and then, you know, in the case of pull, that's why it's bigger, pull it out of the way and then squeeze through. Would that be detrimental? You know, it, it's, and this is something, by the way, and I'll share it with you, uh, that I normally share in most of these presentations. I share this with my clients. Because so much of ADA seems to be focused on wheelchair access, yeah. it's so much more than that. Yeah. And, and I think we lose track of that a lot. Um, you know, not everybody, when we talk about protruding objects, not everybody is 100% pitch black blind. Some people, including myself, just, you know, I'm not legally blind, but I'm, my sight's not as good as it was when I was 18. You gotta take that into consideration. Uh, the high, you know, uh, I hated bending over, I still hate bending over to drink from a low water fountain, because my lower back is not a friend of mine. Um, so it's all those things, and so there, there are other benefits to that maneuvering clearance, but because it's written generally, yeah, it applies. <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of like the old joke, the, the Braille menu at the McDonald's drive through which, by the way, they don't do anymore. <laughs> but, yeah, it is what it is. Anything else? Okay, thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed it.